So, my name is uh, Cristina Vladescu. I'm uh, the project manager uh, of this project in Romania, Keeping Children Safe in Sports. Uh, this project is uh, funded by um, the European uh, Commission through the program Rights, Equality and Citizenship Program. And we implement it in partnership with the Delzom Hellas. And I'm very happy that we are here with uh, Maria Atanasiki, the project uh, manager from- Good morning. Good morning, yes. everyone. Hi. Nice to meet you. I've heard a lot about the work you're doing in Romania. So very glad to be here with you today. Yes, we are very, very glad as well. I'm glad that we are doing this webinar together. And I know there are some colleagues from Greece as well, Niki and Magia, maybe other um, colleagues as well. So I'm very glad that now it's international because we have a lot of Romanian colleagues and friends as well now. So that's why I'm, I'm glad because we joined the forces and uh, Thomas from Hungary uh, and uh, maybe uh, I hope um, Alketa, Alketa Lascu is from Third Zone from the Regional Child Protection and Safeguarding um, Advisor Europe region. I'm not sure if she entered or not yet. Uh, okay. And of course, Paul Bercha, who will actually, he's the expert and he will present you most of this webinar. We just uh, would like to introduce you a little bit the project and the larger perspective, and then we will let him. Right, Maria? Yes. Yes, Christina. Yes. So as I told, as I tell you, so keeping children safe in sports is uh, implemented in partnership with the Hash Hellas and the regional office uh, of Tertesom um, Europe region from Hungary. Uh, is funded um, between uh, 20, 20, uh, 2019 up to 2021. It will end in August, and it's quite. Uh, uh, it's quite a complex and very beautiful project that would like to um, promote child safeguarding policies and procedures in sport um, settings and recreational settings from Romania and Greece. So we are in the mirror. What we implement in Romania, we implement as well in Greece, and I would let uh, Maria explain you quick. I will share the screen just you to have uh, a few slides and a, a little bit of a vision of what are we, are we doing. Um, just a second, just a second. Is it okay? Is it this in? Okay, keeping children safe in sports. So uh, in Romania, um, we are very honored and happy because it's a pilot project that we implemented uh, uh, with the official support of the National Authority of the Protection of Child Rights of the Child and Adoption, and in partnership with Romanian Football and Gymnastic Football Federations. We as well invite uh, all, we invite all sport federation to join uh, the initiative. In Greece, uh, Maria will um, share you a little bit. So the, you, I know we implement, we cooperate with more than 21 summer camps from over, over the country. Yes, Christina. So, well, in Greece, actually, the way we implement the project is quite different. We don't have the very pleased, we're not in the very pleasant position as with TDH in Romania, that has a very good and fruitful cooperation already with the Federation of uh, Sport, uh, Football and Gymnastics. TDH LAS is quite new here in Greece. So, networking with the uh, with uh, the athletes and federation, it's quite more challenging. We are getting there slowly. So with uh, regards to Greece, we started implementing the projects in the summer camps, which is another space where professionals come in contact with children. And we there is also a need there to increase the protective environment for them. So we started with a very interesting um, training of trainer of trainers in October, as we did also in Romania. It's very interesting that uh, you should know we are in contact communication with Christina and Paul. So we know what is happening there, even though we, you have never met us. And the same with uh, the Greek people here. So yes, we have engaged 21 summer camps. It's a very big business sector. And uh, we are right now working on establishing the policies with them. 
and we will continue as you will do increase with the trainings and round tables etc so i will let christina continue but just a very uh, brief overview of the context uh, in greece thank you very much my dear team so what we aim in this project we aim to as i told you to develop these child safeguarding policies as a means to protect and safeguard children to improve the competencies of professionals as maria said based on the tot and based on the tot for um, uh, the coaches and uh, summer camp staff and paul will describe you during this webinar our methodology this is the subject of this uh, uh, for now for today uh, we uh, um, we uh, would like as well very much the core of the project is to listen to the voice of children and to inform them about their rights in recreational and sports settings. We set uh, child advisory boards in both countries and uh, we develop a beautiful methodology for children that will be the subject of the next webinar. Um, and uh, we will uh, deliver different uh, awareness sessions for use in clubs and summer camps in order for them to better know their rights and uh, uh, learn to speak out if they have problems or concerns. Not at last, the subject, I mean, a very important uh, objective is to exchange good practices at international level. That's why we are very glad now that we come from different international contexts during this webinar even now. So this is a good chance to, to learn from each other. So as Maria told you, we started with the research. Uh, the research uh, was uh, conducted in Romania and in Greece. And um, we discussed with uh, staff and coaches. And uh, we had focus group with youth with more than 15 summer camps or club managers with 65 coaches or member staff and uh, children and asked them about uh, what are their attitudes about uh, regarding safeguarding? What do they believe that it should be uh, um, good to be developed from as we were at the point to, to develop our methodology? So up to now, we did this research that was uh, very, it was a lot of work and an impressive result. Based on it, we uh, drafted a child safeguarding policy that would be contextualized, I mean, it's contextualized in Greece and in Romania and uh, um, will be uh, useful for different summer camps and uh, for uh, all the sport disciplines, we hope. We developed this TOT curricula for both for adults and for young people and the awareness uh, materials. As Maria told you, we had this TOT, the training of five days, both in Romania and in Greece last year. It was very uh, impressive. And personally for me, it was um, the moment when I felt that, uh, yeah, we will be on a good track. And uh, this, uh, uh, all the, the project, what, what wish is very good. And we have great people in Romania and in Greece for sure. But in Romania, it's a, as well because I met the people from Romania and some of you are here and thank you for the trust. And thank you, Paul, for you, you delivered the training last year. But we are quite a network that uh, is quite uh, eager to listen to you and to make all the needed changes as for people, for young people to always feel and be protected while they are doing uh, their best, uh, I mean, in sport. So, and now until um, end of May and end of June, maybe we are in a process of uh, multiplication trainings. We deliver uh, many trainings um, in different regions, for instance, in Romania, where we try to, um, to provide all the info for other coaches in order for them to be able to uh, protect you. This is the group from Romania. I, I'm sure you have beautiful photos as well, Maria. Say, I say hi to all, but this is very good. And this, are, this is about the session for children and what we have uh, next to develop in our project. Basically, we will try to certificate the procedure of child safeguarding standards in sports and summer camps um, in both countries and to develop uh, a quality label, child safe environment in Greece and as well in Romania. 
so big uh, and important steps. Would you like to add, Maria? From our oh, Christina, just, yeah, just to add from your yes. side. Yeah, so what we faced here in Greece is that um, it was very impressive for us that the initial resistance of the professionals to work on child protection was very quickly actually turned down during the training of trainers in October. So in the beginning, professionals feel very, um, they hesitate to discuss about child protection because they feel that they are targeted, that we point the fingers uh, on them. But then we realized that when they uh, all met each other in Athens, they felt the common responsibility they bear to protect the children. So equally, as it was in, uh, in Romania, it was also in Greece, a very interesting position, a very interesting experience, um, the training of trainers. And it was actually one of the most important uh, moments professionally many of the people involved have had in their lives. So it exceeded our expectations and we are very happy to see this, um, you know, uh, response from the professionals we work with. Yes, that's great. And we feel the same. To be honest, yeah, and being honest with uh, all the professionals that are also attending this webinar, Christina, and also in Greece and Romania, understanding child safeguarding is not an easy thing. For many of us, it also takes a lot of time to understand what child, child safeguarding is, where it starts, where it finishes, what does it imply. So we respect that. We respect the fact that professionals and new contexts need their time. Um, as we were saying with Paul, positive change has many stages. So from the stage of ignorance, we go to the stage of uh, acknowledgement and then we start taking actions for a positive change. So this is something we need to acknowledge and we respect the time people need to get committed to that. And we are very happy that they have gradually uh, got there together with us. And there is a lot of, there are many things we will do all together and we feel very optimistic on that. Thank you, Maria. Yes. You're welcome. So um, now it's half past 12. I will uh, hand over to, to Paul. To uh, Paul is our um, expert uh, on child safeguarding. Um, he uh, created the methodology of the TOT course together with us and delivered the training. And uh, it's my pleasure and I have all the trust in him that he will enchant you with everything he will say and feel you part of the project. Thank you very much. Great, before I start, can I just check, can you all hear me okay? Yes, I mean. Can, yeah, you can hear me, okay, perfect. I'm ah. just gonna share my screen now. Paul, and just my... a second, yeah. You yes, should- Please carry on. Yes, and uh, the questions maybe to just to tell them to the invitees that they can write in the chat box. I forgot to say. Absolutely. And Don't worry. After I will, the presentation, I will, you will return. Yeah, I will, I will summarize that, uh, Christina. Okay, just to check, you should be able to see now in front of you, it's the main screen, which says uh, Keeping Children Safe in Sports Projects. Can you all see that? We can raise our hands, or if not, we can write in the chat room. Perfect. If, if, if one of you can just let me know that you can see the main screen, because I think that's very important right now. Okay. Can we see that, Christina? Yes. We can. Okay, perfect. So let's get started then. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for welcoming me, Christina and Maria, to be part of this project. For me, whenever I talk about child safeguarding in sport, I'm thinking about how we started. And I remember our first discussion back in March, April last year, when we were thinking, what can we do? We knew, all of us, we knew that there is a need. All of us, we knew that we could do something and we had the right opportunity through the project called Keeping Children Safe in Sport. We had the right opportunity to do something there. Now we can see this webinar is called the third round. And why is that? Because we already had two other webinars. Now this one, just this morning I was thinking, what would be the right name for this one? And I would tell you, I was right in calling it Safer Children. Why? When we started the discussion, it was two or three of us. Now, just in this webinar, we are 34, 35 people 
people. And straight away with that thought in mind, we are that many this morning or this afternoon for some of us. That means that we are already keeping children safer. Why? Because we are building the momentum. All of us, we are very important in this because once we are aware, once we know what we need to do, we know that when we are at the right time in the right moment, when a child might suffer, might be abused, neglected, we can do something about it. Maria summarized so beautifully one of my initial ideas as well, when she said about the fact that there is that resistance. There is always a resistance when we talk about keeping children safe. Why? Because sometimes people feel afraid to talk about it. But also children, children don't know how to talk about these sorts of things. And often children don't, didn't talk about these situations because probably they had no idea what was happening to them. So that's why we start with that resistance. And I remember, for example, when we did the first, when we did the TOT in, in Bucharest, I remember how people came there kind of skeptical. So they were just thinking, is this for me? Why am I here? What will I learn from there? But what I can tell you is that at the end of those five days, most of the people said, actually, I can see now my role. I can see how I can keep children safer by actually fulfilling my child safety responsibilities. So that's why with that idea in mind, I just want to welcome everyone today and also to tell you a little bit more about what have we done and to describe the curricula. So all that hard work that Maria, Christina and I put together to try and give a framework or provide a framework to all of us how we can fulfill this responsibility to keep children safe or safer in sport. So just briefly, I just want to remind ourselves Christina and Maria, they presented the achievements. For me, the biggest achievement that we had so far is that more and more we have people coming on board and more and more we understand that responsibility to keep children safe. But also we are now into the phase where we are actually doing more and more training. In Romania, for example, we have trainings on a weekly basis between now and, uh, and uh, March, uh, April time, when we are actually discussing with people that come to our trainings to tell them that we play a part and we can do that part in terms of safeguarding. Now, one thing that I would like to say from the very beginning is that we don't want us to become paranoid. We don't want us to think that it has to happen in my club. It has to happen in my summer camp. We don't want that at all. What we want instead, we want us to be ready. We want us to be prepared. So in case something is or might happen, at least we can say hand on heart, I know what I need to do and I'm gonna do those things. Why? Because I want to put the child at the center. Christina mentioned earlier about the voice of the child. Let's pay attention to that. What is the child telling me? And what do I understand from what the child or the young person playing sport or being in a summer camp can actually tell me? And let's always start with that. Let's pay a little a bit of attention to that as well. So that is one of the biggest achievements. The fact that we are together, the fact that we build this momentum together, and the fact that we are able to deliver this in a different in different context. We are here from, uh, from different parts in Europe, different parts in Romania, and that's why let's all contribute to that. Now, of course, the main part of the webinar today, it's about the curricula. And we will be presenting the curricula, I will be presenting the curricula, but also it says very reflective discussion. Now we won't be able to have a discussion just like the one we have when we are face to face. But as Christina was saying, please, I'll keep an eye on the chat as well. And I know Christina is also looking on the chat. Put your questions there. As I talk through the materials, if anything doesn't make sense, ask the question there. If, if anything, for example, makes you feel curious and you would like us to reflect more about it, write your questions in the chat box. And then at the end of this webinar, we'll spend probably 10 or 15 minutes or 20 minutes if needed to answer all the questions that you might have. But we will see the curriculum is an extensive document. It has in it more than, it has 14, uh, 14 modules in it. So I would like us to go through all of them and see exactly what do we learn from it and how can actually use that curricula for me to become a better safeguarding coach, a better safeguarding staff member of the summer camp, but also how can I inspire others to use this in order to, to, to develop capacity. Now, the next thing that I would like us to do, we'll do this towards the end of the webinar. Uh, our uh, Keeping Children Safe in Sport policy and procedures, they are part, they are addendums to the curricula. And also to, to raise the ball, I would say, or to, to put the ball in your courtyard, as we might say sometimes in tennis or in other sports that, that involves uh, uh, playing, playing with the ball. I would like to put the ball in your courtyard for us to see what can I do? What can any of us do to actually implement these policies and these procedures? Because we know research 
worldwide research tells us this. If we implement the right child safeguarding policy, if we have all the right procedures in place, straight away the children will feel and the children will be safer. Why? Because we and I, as adults, we are able to do that. And then the last thing, of course, we'll do the questions and the answers. Now, for us to start the discussion, I just want to share here something that I've seen in some, some researches, for example, about emotional harm. There is always that question, there is always that question, why does this apply to me? Why do we need to talk about keeping children safe in sport? And the answer is more and more clear, but the answer, it is given partly by the research, but also by the children or by the adults who have unfortunately experienced abuse through sport and in the summer camps. And that's why listening to their voices, and I think Glasser in 2011, he summarized this very, very well. He said that sports and leisure centers or schools or summer camps are highlighted in the literature as times and places when and where children can also be at risk of um, harm from emotionally abusive adults. Now, I also recall here a study which was published by UNICEF back in 2016, which said that there are millions of children around the globe that experience physical abuse from the teachers, for example. So the numbers are absolutely astronomic, far, far, far too, too, too large numbers there. And for me also as a professional, but also as a father, I would say that even if a child suffers abuse or neglect through, through sport or in the summer camps is one child too many. Now these instances, however, they are very, very rare. And I would like to link this with what I said earlier. So we shouldn't be panicking about these issues, but what we should do, we should be ready and prepared in case it happens to any of us in a sports club, in a sport federation or in a summer camp. Now, in a US study, this was in 2010, we found out that only 7% of emotional abuse um, is perpetrated by non-resident adults. Now, what do we mean by that? Those non-resident adults could be any of us. It could be any of us actually in those sports clubs, in the summer camps, any of us, we could do or don't do something which might lead the child to feel, let's say, less valued compared to the other children, for example. I remember when during the TLTs, we shared so many examples, and that's why today I will be sharing some of those. But when I look at the learning, the learned lessons from all of us from the, from the TLTs, we said that now we know how we need sometimes to, to use the right language when we work with a child, when the child is there for us to guide them, to coach them, to train them and to make them reach higher levels of performance. But also the child is there as a, as, as a, as a person with a strong voice that we need, to, we need to listen to. Now I put here in the, in the presentation, you have there the YouTube video for the video called the Magical Kids Sport. But I'm not gonna show it right now. I just want you to have it there in the slides. So please take a moment. Some of you already watched it probably. If you haven't, after this webinar, you'll be receiving the, um, the PowerPoint presentation as well. Click on it and have a look to see what do children tell us. And you will find out that the children tell us exactly how it is. They tell us that they love playing sport, but how come that sometimes us as grown-ups could be parents or staff, Sometimes we are so passionate about sport, but we forget about the fact that when I shout, when I shout, that has an impact on the child. When I swear because somebody missed, I don't know, missed something or in a sports activity at the summer camp, a child is not able to do as well as other children. When we shout to children, when we raise our voices, that has that emotional impact. Children in this video, they, they, they capture this so, so well. So please, please have a look and see what you feel about it. And if you feel that like it's a nice video, why not spread the word about it? Also, we know that Terre des Hommes is launching the campaign on keeping children safe in sport. And we have a very good video for that as well. So soon, once it's ready, once we translate it, also that will be available as well. So for that, please keep in touch with Christina, keep in touch with Maria to make sure that you can see those up to date video footages, which we can use to spread the word. Now, before I move any further here, before we talk about the, the, the curricula, what I would like to highlight is our work. Obviously, we have not reinvented the wheel. It's not that 
Christina, Maria, and I came together with all of these ideas. No, it's not. But what we've done, we acknowledge all the good achievements that Ted Dezom has done in partnership with UEFA, with UEFA, for example. So we know that Ted Dezom, a few years ago in 2018, Ted Dezom entered a partnership with UEFA, and we are the, the main and the only uh, child protection partner with UEFA. So a lot of good work has been done there. And since then, we've seen that UEFA has started the process of implementing the child safeguarding policies across all the national associations in, the, in, in, in Europe. But also we know that the work that we've done, as I said, it's not all new. We, we use the international child safeguarding standards. We use other international standards in sport, for example. So we try to look into all the possible resources and we put them in this curricula. Why? To be easier for us to actually learn about safeguarding and to do something when a child might suffer because of abuse, neglect, or any other, sometimes we call them adverse childhood experiences. Because of all of that, we used it to create this, this very, very good and very informative curricula. Now, just to create the, 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 the framework, for example. So when we wrote the curricula, we had this international child safeguarding standards in mind. And what do we mean by that? We are meaning that we need to have very, very clear policies. Now, for me, I am very, very fortunate that I do a lot of training in the UK and actually I'm in lockdown in the UK now, so I can only work, not do much aside, aside that thing. But, but we know that in the UK, we have very, very strong child protection policies, child safeguarding policies. Now, what, can also, what I can also say is that the policy that was put together by Ter de Zom, it's also a very, very strong one, very explicit, and it's very informative and very good to be applied into practice. So for the ones of us that haven't seen that yet, please have a look into it. Have a look and see how you feel. And when you look into that, try and reflect, how can I apply that in practice? How can I put it in practice? Now, literature in child safeguarding tells us that once we have strong, clear, and applicable policies in place, straight away, the children feel safer. They feel safe because they know that us as accountable professionals, accountable sports people or summer camp staff, we know what to do in case any of them feels hurt, abused or neglected. Now also we have the whistleblowing policy there. What do we mean by that? When I identify any poor practice, what will I do about it? So if I raise my voice, it's not because I want to mean to one another, because I've, I've identified the poor practice and I know that it's my duty to do something about it. And then the code of conduct, of course, for us as staff members of the club or some summer camps, for us as volunteers, be in contact with children, but also it could be code of conduct for children and code of conduct for the parents as well. Now, in terms of procedures, how well am I at recruiting staff? Also, I would like to, uh, to uh, mention here a study which was done in, um, in Denmark some good years ago, and it said that if a sports club or when a sports club recruiting um, uh, a new member, and if they knew about that member pre previously, they didn't do any checks or only 2% of the clubs have done any checks to try and see whether there are any concerns with the previous club. Yeah. And then when we think about the other figures, only 5% do ch did checks when they didn't know that person before. But that to me raises a massive alarm bell because what if I was that member of staff? What if I did something to abuse or to neglect the child and by you not checking me, by you not talking to the previous employers or the previous sports clubs or, or uh, summer camps, it might be that you allow somebody that has abused children in the past to actually be part of your staff group. And that's not keeping children safe. That's it where we fail. Now, in terms of induction, how do we do that? How well do we talk about safeguarding? How well do we ask questions, for example, even when we recruit or when we do inductions, to see is that person aware of what safeguarding actually is and how do we raise the voice if we are concerned? Now, allegations, allegations refers to when I'm concerned about the child's safety and also in our context, in the context of child safeguarding in sport and summer camps, when I identify that a member of staff poses risk to children, and I have some evidence there, how do I report that? Who do I talk to? And the child, the policy put together by Ted Zone will give us all those procedures. It will tell us exactly how to do it. It will also guide us how to record the information and to share the information with the child protection agencies who are responsible as a statutory agency to actually keep children safe. 
Now, the next part that we'll be seeing there is the people. We are all these people. How well do we work together? How well we communicate within our sports clubs and summer camps, but also how well do we actually talk to the partner agencies? Do I know when to report the case? And do I know how to report the case? We are all responsible. Safeguarding is our responsibility. There are expectations that if as a member of a sports club or a federation or a summer camp, I need to be fully aware that if I see a child suffering abuse, I need to do something about it. Simply, we cannot turn the blind eye because if I turn the blind eye, those children suffer. I can mention here some examples for, uh, from, from, from Spain, from gymnastics, from football, from summer camps. And what we've seen in these examples in all of them, we've seen that when the children tell us actually is not just the person that perpetrates the abuse and neglect that knows about that, but also the, people, the other people around the perpetrators and around the child. But somehow in the past, those people remained silent. They were quiet as opposed to actually speaking up and doing something to promote that child's safety and that child's well-being. Now, training and support, of course, this curricula is all about training and support. It's all about how we can be more aware, how we know how to recognize the abuse, how we know how to respond to abuse. And accountability we are all accountable. We have to review what we've done. We have to audit. We need to do the quality assurance. We need to do supervision or to do a lot of talk with regard to how to actually implement these uh, this, uh, child safeguarding concerns. Now, what I would like us to do here, I'm just going to pause just for a few seconds. And I'm just curious if anyone has a piece of paper next to them, or if you want to write something in the chat, please, what things do come to your mind, just based on hearing this, hearing about this model. And please write, write those thoughts in the chats, and I will be coming to them a little bit later. So please tell us, do they make sense? Or do you think that it's more confusing than helpful? And also, do we think that this applies to us or not? And think fair with your current role. Yeah, so you are in your role at the summer camp, in, in a non government organization, sports club, whatever you want. Just try and think, how does this apply to me? And write some thoughts there in the next few seconds. And also, as I said, towards the end of this webinar, we'll come back to those to see how did we feel at the beginning? How do we feel at the end of looking into this curricula? Yeah, so please, write those. I'll continue talking, but also I'm sure you can multitask better than I do. So you'll be hearing me, but also start typing things in the chat. So when we look about this curricula, how did, you, how did we intend and how did we start with it? First of all, we started to think about an introduction. We needed to talk more about the Keeping Children Safe in Sport project, which I said earlier, it's a very important project. It's a very innovative project, but also it's, it's creating the, the momentum amongst all of us. So, of course, we introduced the project, but also then we looked at the macro picture. We looked at the worldwide context and we looked at how spread this issue actually, actually is. Now, more and more, if we look in the news, for example, in the news, we see more and more situations when adults or children actually talk now more about the fact that they experience abuse at the present time or they experienced abuse in the past. So when we hear some, somebody saying, it does not apply to me, for me personally, I would challenge that because it does apply to us. As long as I'm in contact with children, I need to know about these things. I need to be prepared. If it doesn't happen that I identify a case of abuse, that's great. But what if it happens? How do I answer? And that's why the world context gave us, give us the big picture with regard to what we mean by child safeguarding. Now, in, the, in, the, in this module, we do provide a lot of statistics. We do talk about those millions of children, millions of girl, girls who report sexual abuse, for example. One other thing that uh, I've, I've seen in the news in the UK in 2020 is that there is a high number of children who are actually performing sexual acts in front of the camera because they are groomed by perpetrators and they are coerced into doing that. I'm sure that doesn't just apply in England. I'm sure probably that's worldwide as well. And we know more and more international literature tells us that uh, the grooming of children because of this world crisis, because of the COVID-19, the grooming most of the time starts in front of the camera. It starts off on, on internet. Now, for me, I wanted on this, on this slide also to highlight about that everyone's responsibility. It is our responsibility. We, it should concern all those involved in sports and summer camps. Sports staff, volunteer, parents, children, we share a duty and we need to adhere to the principles of the safe sport and sport, safe environments in summer camps as bad as good as good practices there.
So we started by introducing, then what we said is that let's define this child safety environment. And please imagine when you look at these modules, I know I'm presenting it as a kind of theoretical framework. This is based on practice. So I think what we've done very well, uh, Christina, Maria and I, we thought, we thought thoroughly about how to translate this, um, this theory into practice and it was based on activities. So when we defined uh, what was meant by child safeguarding, we did a very nice activity, which was called the red line, for example, where we used our own experiences to try and reflect um, does it apply to me or does it not? It was, it, it was a, not a surprise, but it was what we expected. All of us, we said, I understand that it applies to me and I understand that I have a duty to respond to these sorts of concerns. Of course, we looked at increasing awareness about uh, keeping children safe standards. We did learn about safe environment. What does it mean? And we started looking there at all of those principles that we've seen so far. What is a safe environment? A safe environment is when people know about child safeguarding and also they know how to respond to child safeguarding. And then how do we create a safe culture? That's again, going through all those principles that we've seen before, starting with when I recruit a person, when I do the induction, when I do the training, when I, when I shadow sometimes, and I, I talk to that person about other things that are new in terms of safeguarding. And also we've realized that the best way to actually create a safe culture is to create a context when we are open to new information, when we discuss, when we have reflective discussions, when we're being curious, but also when we challenge one another, because it might be, I you might see a situation, you might see it completely different. I might say, no, it's not abuse. You might say, actually, it is abuse because a child suffers. Why? Because of something that happened in that sport club or something that happened in the summer camp. And that's why through those discussions, we will find the answer. Should I be concerned or should I not? I remember a quote from Eileen Monroe. She's done some very, very good work back in 2010, 2011. And Eileen Monroe said this, Conflicts and disagreements, when we talk about uh, child safety and child well-being, should not be avoided, but we should embrace it. And why should we do that? Why would I enter a conflict? Because I want the child to feel safe. I want the child to be safe and I want the child to feel well. And that's our role. That stays within our powers. Now, module three. We started discussing about the values and principles. Now I know in sports, for example, what are the key values there? We promote the game, isn't it, as a safe and as a fun activity. We promote the game as a team effort and sometimes individual efforts, depending on the sport. We do appreciate a lot the input of the fans into, into that sport. So all of those principles, we integrated them here and we are trying to reflect what values do I bring here? Sometimes it might be also our, our workers or professional bias. Now, all of us, we were born into, into families and, and we, we adopted those families or sometimes they were imposed on us. Sometimes those values could be very, very detrimental. More and more we talk about, for example, uh, girls or females playing in some sports which used to be predominant um, men's sports, like football, for example, like rugby. Now, I remember having a discussion with a friend of mine uh, some good weeks ago and just said, Paul, actually in England, what do we see? In England, our female national team is doing far better compared to our male national football team. And if you look at the records, at least in the last four years, the England national team has gone all the way to the top in the World Cup. Yeah, when England team, they are not doing that well. So these values sometimes could be barriers. And that's why we said, let's discuss about the values. Let's all be aware. What values do I bring into the picture? And then let's think about the principles of child safeguarding. I remember again, and it happens, it happens everywhere in, in, in the world. And more and more, we need to tackle these sorts of situations. It's something that happened in Cluj, the city that I love so much in Romania. I've seen that in at university, uh, a staff of the university made comments there that a child or a young person is responsible or partly responsible for somebody that abuses them. And they mentioned their sexual abuse. Now, irrespective of the reasons, irrespective of what that person said, a child is never to be blamed for being abused. I remember, for example, visiting Greece some good years ago when, when I met the team from Tedeson there. And I remember when I've seen in big letters on a wall, the fact that I wear a skirt, it doesn't mean that I, I say yes. So please don't abuse me, don't sexually abuse me because it doesn't mean yes. Yeah? I wear a skirt, it's my choice. But sometimes we are feeling that these, these, these views are so strong in some of us, in a small number of us, when we might use those wrong values, wrong principles, and we might abuse children. So we know, why do we talk about values and principles? 
because we need to be fully aware about the rights of the children. We need to raise awareness. We need to think about participation to hear the voice of the child. Now, I know some of us might say, and I say it as well, as, as well as a parent sometimes, I know best because I'm an adult. But that doesn't mean that I should ignore the voice of the child. Let's grow our children into having a voice. Obviously, when they step over the boundary, of course, we need to set the boundary clear so they know what is right, what is not right. But through our role modeling, they can learn from us. So that's why, please take a moment here and think about that thing. What have I done in a training session at my club? What have I done at the summer camp, for example, to make sure that I hear the voice of the child and I role model those values and and principles that help a child to be the wonderful citizen that they become when they turn into adulthood. Yeah, so please take a moment to think about that. Now, after that, we said, let's talk about the child's rights in more details. Let's talk about participation. We used here the Hearts Ladder of Participation and the Mundi model. If you haven't heard about it, please get in touch with us and ask for those documents. They are very, very good documents. And also they are very good in terms of guiding us how to hear the voice of the child in a meaningful way. Too often, what we see in child safeguarding, it's too often that we ask the question, the child tells us their voice, but probably by the time they do that, our attention is somewhere else. And that's not good enough. It's not good enough to do that. So it's always, what is the meaning of that? What do I hear from the child? I know some of the examples that I use, for example, in, in trainings, is when, uh, when somebody, a child might say, uh, my life is not worth living for. So when a child says something as powerful as that, the least that I could do is to sit down with the child in a quiet environment, in a safe environment, and also to ask the child, please tell me in your own words, what do you mean by that? What made you say something so powerful? Yeah, my life is not worth living for, which means that probably that child has an intent to self-harm or even to end their life, to commit suicide. So let's give those children that voice. Let's stay with them. And this could also be applied in both in, in the sports activities, for example, in the summer camps. What if a child cannot do the task that you ask for? What if the child feels it's too much? And if they do it, they might collapse there. I remember Nadia Komanech, the, the, the famous Romanian gymnast. I remember when she said in a TV interview, she said, I was lucky and I was strong enough to do probably 10 more rounds. Some of my colleagues were not. So was that, un did, did, was that faced with understanding from the coach to say, actually, yes, slow down a little bit, have a break? Or did the coach actually push everyone to do exactly the same as Nadia could do. We know from my, in my journey with Terre des Hommes, for example, I've met many, many sports people who said exactly the same as Nadia. And also they were able to tell me that in some cases, when we push the child too much, we push them towards that pressure to perform. When we push the child, some of them suffered injuries. And unfortunately, because of those injuries, they had to stop doing the sport completely. Now, I would like us here to think back for a moment and what is the definition of child safeguarding in sport and in summer camps? We are saying that all these sports activities, all the recreational activities should be fun and safe for all the children, irrespective of their involvement in the game and activity and irrespective of their ability to play. That's why some of us, sometimes we might say, yes, Paul, but for us to achieve, for the children to, to be on the podiums, for the children to be, uh, let's say, Olympic champions, world champions, we need to push for more. I, I fully agree with you. We need to do that. But also at the stage when the children leave, uh, reach those high stages of, um, of uh, performance, you should see the steps that are happening until then. Because if you push from too far too quickly, it might be that they receive that sport as a very negative, uh, they have a negative perception of the sport, and that will be a barrier for them to go up on this ladder of, of, of performance. So please take a moment and think about that. I know we don't have unfortunately time to debate about this, and I would love to, but we have, we designed this, uh, this uh, webinar as a presentation rather than a full dialogue. But put your answers in the chat, and I'll be answered to those when we come towards the end of the end of the session. Module number five, this is about communication, it's about confidentiality, and this is all about us being reflectors. I'm sure all of us, we have different communication styles. Some of us, we have to be direct when we have to tell the child it's, it's time to stop, that's not okay, you cannot bully the other child or you cannot push, you cannot do those. Some other times it might be the time when I sit down and I listen to the child. So when I give the child the floor and I'm gonna ask the child, so tell me, can we do a little bit more? What else could we do right now? Let's consult them into that. I remember having a discussion with a very informal discussion with a, with a Romanian gymnast 
who has reached the top levels of performance. And I remember when I talked about this, uh, these topics, uh, she said this, I'd wished somebody did these sorts of talks and discussions when I was still performing in gymnastics. So that statement says a lot. It says a lot that probably we missed cues. Probably we were so driven by the adult needs for performance rather than actually talking to that child. So let's think about that. Let's think about how we can incorporate that. Now understand confidentiality, understand disclosure. We know that when a child tells us about not being well, not feeling well, we know that in, in rare cases, we might have to report that case or to report the child to the child protection agencies in the local area. Now in that in mind, you need to know how to identify those services. And also you need to know how to report. What do you need information you need to pass to them? So also we need to think about confidentiality. How do we promote that? How do we do those sorts of things? Now in the policy, we do have a specific element, especially on that. How do we fulfill confidentiality? And how do I manage any disclosure or any reports when the child has suffered abuse or neglect? Now we know that, what do we want to help us or what do we want to do with the children? We want our children to be resilient. We want them to feel motivated. We want them to perform well. We want them to enjoy the activities. But as I said earlier, we want them to feel safe. Now, what does safety mean? Safety means that I've got a safety base there. I've got something that keeps me safe, which could be the trust relationship with a coach. It could be the good or, or, and the healthy uh, home relationships between parent and child. So all of those, it will help the children build resilience. Now, what we know is that when a child is abused and neglected through sport, in sport, around sport, or in the summer camps, straight away that child's resilience is affected. And we know in cases of sexual abuse, we know that actually the perpetrator is grooming not like the child that they will abuse, but they groom also the, the people around the child, including the parents, including other people from the sports club or from the summer camp. So when we see those sorts of signs, when we see that uh, any indication that the child's behavior or the child's emotional emotional emotions has changed significantly, let's do something about it. Let's be curious. Let's try and find out a little bit more. Because usually that's how abuse and neglect actually starts. Uh, I know usually I talk about Andrew Woodward. Yeah? Andrew Woodward was one of the most promising uh, young players, football players in the UK. And uh, the predictions were that he would be uh, the lead team, uh, the lead uh, player of the national England uh, football team. But did he get there? He did get there. What did he reach the, the predictions? No, he didn't. Because he was sexually abused by his former coach called Barry Bonnell. And Barry Bonnell actually raped him on more than 500 occasions. So that's why in this course, we thought that it would be very, very useful to, to offer you, to, to promote there some tools to actually promote resilience and also to promote that conscious practice. Now, we might say, why do we need to do conscious practice? We need to do it because, because some of us have been in this field had been in the sports clubs, had been coaches for many, many years. Some of us have been working for summer camps for many years. Probably sometimes we do those things subconsciously. Let's bring it back in conscious practice and let's reflect about how do I respond? How do I talk to the child? How do I make sure that I push the child to achieve better? How do I do that? By us bringing it back in conscious practice, that's going to make us better reflectors, but also it will make us better in terms of understanding the child and having that dialogue with the child. Now, the next model, we called it leadership in child safeguarding, and we felt it was very, very useful to do this. Why? Because uh, we know that all of us, we are leaders for children, but also by me being a leader for the child, actually, I'm going to nurture that child, and that child, hopefully, they will learn from me how to do a leader of themselves, how they can achieve this leadership, uh, leadership uh, higher levels of leaderships as well. I remember here, for example, I'm thinking about sports again, or I'm thinking, let's think about summer camps. I remember when I was in a summer camp, and I remember that we did uh, do some uh, football activity together, and we were in the final against another team from the same summer camp. And I remember how our teacher, our PE teacher, physical education teacher, was so good to guide us. And I remember how in the difficult moment, he was giving us that look from the side, from the bench, just that look, it's okay. You're doing absolutely fine. You can do it. And guess what? When he sent us those positive vibes, that reassurance, when we could see the calm on his face, 
We won the match and it was a very, very difficult match, but we've done it. The same as with sport. For me, I would like to quote here uh, or to, to speak here about Simona Halep. We know she used to be and she was uh, number one in ATP. So what happened with her? How often do we see that she makes eye contact with her coach from the bench? And after she face, makes that eye contact, in most times, she becomes calmer. She, she regroups herself and then she can win that final. Yeah? And we've seen she's won so many finals and now she's actually going through the Austrian uh, Australian uh, Open at this, at this moment in time. So that's why we talked about leadership because we inspire the children that are there with us at the summer clubs or in the, in the sports, um, uh, summer camps or sports clubs. And, and we used here the model which is called FED future engage the deliver and that's why if you feel that you want to know more about it have a look and we describe there the model but also we have activities that would help us try and embed this fed, fed model or future engaged deliver model now after that we talked about the theories in child safeguarding now this is one of the core and the main modules in this uh, in this uh, curriculum and why am i saying that in order for me to understand the lived experience of abuse, I need to see what theories can help me to understand what happened to the child. I mentioned earlier adverse childhood experiences. We can also see it here in the bottom bullet point there. Also, it is good to mention here about attachment relationships. How much do I know about the relationships I'm forming with the child, but also how much do I know about the parent and child relationships as well? How do we respond, for example, when there is a mother that comes and tell us Paul, I want my daughter to be the next Nadia Comaneci or the next whatever famous sports player. How do we respond to that? That child might don't have the, 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 the feeling about that sport. That child might not actually like the sport, but the mother and the father want her to do that. Is that going to be okay? Let's have a talk with the parent. Let's also have a frank discussion to see how we can do that. I'm sure most of you as coaches, when you see children performing in, in the gyms or in, on, on, the, on the, the clubs, you get the feeling whether the child has or not doesn't have the potential. But what if the parent opposes you and they are saying, my daughter or my son have to reach those high levels of performance? Do we agree with that or don't we agree with that? So I said that attachment theory, child development, of course, we need to know that one as well. And also we need to think more about neuroscience. How, to my activities, how can I help the child's brain to grow beautifully, but also to maintain in a healthy, healthy step, healthy stage there as well. We know if a child suffers abuse or neglect, the trauma sits on the right side of the brain. So what does that mean? The right side of our prefrontal cortex is very good at creativity, feelings, emotions. Now the left side of the prefrontal cortex actually is the one that deals with uh, mathematics, thinking, with the rational. Yeah, so the, the rational, the big thinking, we might say the left side of the brain, and the big feeling is the right side of the brain. Now, when a child is abused and neglected, we know that initially the emotional side will be affected because the trauma is on the right side of the brain, but also the two sides are so interlinked, so connected, that the child will suffer also in the other side rationalizing and making sense of what's happening to her. So this is just a kind of broad ideas with regard to these theories, but knowing or having knowledge about these theories, it is very, very helpful for us to quantify what worries me, what makes me be worried about a child who plays sport or a child who comes at the summer camp. The next thing is, of course, recognizing different types of abuse. And when we think about recognizing, the approach that we used here is the the five R's, yeah? The first one is, do I know how to recognize the signs of abuse? The second is, are, are, do, I, are, do I know how to respond when the child shows me the signs or disclose about any signs of abuse? Do I know how to respond? Then of course, I have to record my concerns. I have to report the concerns, meaning referring the cases to child protection agencies. And also the fifth R is reviewing. So when I review, can I now can I say that the child is safe or safer because I've done the right thing to keep the child safe, or can I not? If I cannot say hand on heart the child is safer because I've gone through these five golden rules, then of course I need to revisit what I've done and probably do a little bit more. We know that children that suffer abuse, physical abuse, for example, when the child tells us about it, if I don't do the right thing in that moment to keep the child safe, to protect the child, that child is likely to go home in the same abusive situation or come back at the training in the same abusive relationship with a coach or somebody else from the club or the summer camp. And because the child dare to speak up about the abuse, they will get more abuse and harder abuse. So that's why I think it's very important for us to stop it as soon as humanly possible, because if we stop it, at least I can say, yes, now the child is safer, 
I am safer as well. Also, we need to understand, obviously, the main types of abuse and what are the indicators for that, and also the signs of abuse. So in Pris curricula, we put there as much as possible updated information, and I hope you'll be finding useful. So have a look into it. But also, as I said earlier, please, please remember what I said at the beginning of this webinar. We shouldn't see it like a, a panicky mode, paranoid. It has to happen. It doesn't have to happen. In some sports, we do have injuries. Yeah? We know, for example, when in gymnastics, we have a bleed on our hand. It happens because there is so many catches there and absolutely because of the repetitions of, uh, of all of those uh, exercises, we will have blisters. But this is where you play the most important part in actually understanding, should I be concerned or should I not be concerned? And that's based on your expertise there. That's why if somebody might ask me, so Paul, is a blister a sign of abuse or not? It's difficult for me to say because I'm not in the situation. For you being involved there, you will know whether it is or whether it is not. Why? Because probably it happened to you. Probably it happened to you and then you, 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 you can balance. How did you feel when you were pushed to do more or less uh, more or less uh, exercises given that you had that blister? So it's all about the dialogue and all about how your expertise matters when you decide between or when you define what is accidental and what is non-accidental. Now, module 10 is about situational risk in sport. And what are we talking about here? It's specific, specific situations. We know, I mentioned Andrew, Andrew uh, Woodward. So in his case, we know that as a part of a football team, of course, they had to do overnight stays. So overnight stay, it is one of those situational risks. Why? Because abuse can happen when the child is somewhere else rather than at home with their parents during the night. Barry Bunnell, what did he do? He was to ask Andrew to come into his room in the evening to talk about the strategy of the next, next day match. But when he was there, he was actually raping him. Uh, other things here, physical contact. We know, we know when a child suffers an injury, it can happen. It can happen at a summer camp. It can happen in a football match, gymnastics, that can happen. So they need the massaging, isn't it? They need somebody to, to massage the leg, for example, to, to make the child feel comfortable. And also we know in that situation, that doctor should think straight away, is this child in a position to continue performing or not? What happens if I push the child to go back in the field? Because the child might sometimes say, I can do it. I can do it because I'm motivated and I don't care about the pain. You need to decide where. Is that right or is it not? You are the adult, not the child is the adult. So you need to decide whether if the child continues to play, what is, what are the outcomes? Is the child going to be better or worse? If you are saying or if you are feeling that the child could get a permanent injury or a long-term injury that will keep them off that football pitch, gymnastic courtyard, whatever it is, then you should be uh, strong enough to actually uh, stop the child there. Even if the parent might shout from the side, he can do it or she can do it. No, we should actually balance that situation and we should know how to stop it. Now, the other uh, risk, situational risk could be uh, when we think about changing rooms. Let's say I'm a male coach. Why would I go into my team's uh, changing room, given that I, I coach um, a team of girls? I shouldn't go there. I shouldn't go there unless there is something that tells me that there is an imminent harm there. So unless the building is on fire, unless somebody is abused in there, I shouldn't go in there. But sometimes we've seen that some of us, we, we, we went in there because probably we were annoyed and angry that my team lost the match and we went in there to actually tell them off. It's not the right thing. That's supposed to be a safe environment where we get changed and I can wait. I can wait with my intense feelings to tell them what they did wrong in the match when they come out of it. So I don't have to do it there again. Now, we need to become familiarized with these situational risks. Now, you will find that probably when you look at the both, um, both environments, so sports on one side, the one that we've done in Romania and summer camps in Greece, you need to look at identifying more areas there. For us, we did our best to put as many as we could together. But also we know that our understanding of safeguarding evolves from one meeting to another, from one session to another, it evolves. That's why I would like to put this as a challenge to all of you. If you want to look at the list, think about the sport or the summer camp where you practice. And after that, try and see, have we missed anything? And if we've missed that, please add it on there and let us know as well so we can make this curricula as a kind of work in progress. Through your input, we can make it better. We can make it more accurate. We can make it very applicable to those, to those contexts. 
And of course, once I know the situational risk, of course, I need to know what I'm going to do next. So what I do next, I need to speak to the child. I need to speak to the others involved. I need to ascertain what has happened. And after that, to decide where, which way do I go next? Now, no surprise that the next um, module refers to the child safeguarding champion. Now, we called uh, the, uh, these people child safeguarding champions. Why? Because you are the one that coordinates safeguarding. Now, best practice tells us that in each club, in each sports federation, in each summer camp, there should be at least child safeguarding uh, person or champion. What is their role? Their role is to spread the word about child safeguarding. Their role is to raise awareness. Their role is to do training with the staff. So everybody's in a position that if they see something that's worrying, they know how to respond. Now, there is also, I would like us to look at it here like, like a balance. It might be that I'm new into a summer camp in Greece, and I might not know a lot about child safeguarding. So the first thing that the champion should do is have a discussion with myself, tell me what we mean by child safeguarding, tell me what could be signs, of, signs and indicators of abuse, and after that also to send a clear, clear message. Paul, if you're concerned about the child's safety whilst you are here at the summer camp, the least you could do is come and talk to me as a safeguarding champion so we can discuss it together. We've seen what did you see? How did it make you feel? What is the impact on the child? And at the end of that discussion, we should be able to decide together, should we be concerned or should we not? And that's where we need to start. The child safeguarding champion, of course, they should be on top of the policy, the procedures that we have around child safeguarding, and they should be able, they, they are the point of contact, contact that should be able to give us all the answers there. Now, I know, for example, in England, I can tell you all the sports board clubs, all the, all the sports clubs, all the summer camps, they do have this uh, child safeguarding champion, and in England, it's called the designated safeguarding lead, for example. Now, we know that in Europe, we are now implementing this, and this is why this project is so wonderful because we are implementing, we are doing something to change the things. We will get there. But for us, if, if, out, if from this call, we have, we have 30 plus people in this call, if half of us are actually agreeing to do this role as a champion, straight away, we are doing the right thing to keep the children safe. So please think about that. Read about this role, ask Christina and Maria what, in more details what the role actually means and how you can be yourself that role, and then see how quickly you can actually implement that. Once you've done it, it straight away, it gives us more credibility that we are a safeguarding sports club, federation, or a safeguarding summer camp. Now, the next one, it talks about policy and guidance, and I will come back to policy and guidance at the end of this uh, webinar. Why? Because it is a very depth document. It's a lot of good things in it. And also the policy, it helps us, it guides us how to actually implement that safeguarding, what to do in order to make sure that my club is a safe club and my summer camp is a safe summer camp. So it gives us all the guidance there. The way it's been designed, it was designed for you to actually have it, look at it, and also to, to be flexible about it. So you can adapt it to make sure that it meets the needs. And it's also, it's fit for purpose for your setting in which you might meet children. So I'd like to challenge you here probably to have a look at this policy, try and look through it, but look at it with a, with a critical friend eye, just to see, is this useful, is it not? And if it is useful, try and think straight away, what can I do to adapt it? So I can ask people to actually sign up to it because once we adhere to it, straight away we become better at keeping children safe. Now the next module refers to enabling others. And this is about our ability to do training. Now, I know most of us, most of us in this room, because we are sport champions, because we are coaches, because we are in our roles of working with children, I'm sure you'll find it easier to deliver training or to do raising awareness session. But sometimes you might still be nervous about it because I know safeguarding is a new topic. Usually when I talk about safeguarding, I'm often thinking, how do I translate safeguarding in? I know we have people from Albania here. How do I translate it in Albania? How do I translate it in Romania? How do I translate it in Greek? All of those questions there. And I can tell you, safeguarding is one very difficult word to actually translate. Even if in Romania it might make, uh, it might make sense when we say it, I still have to add more information next to it. And I remember a kind of funny story. One day somebody asked me from Terdezom, Paul, how do you define safeguarding? And for me, I was supposed to answer in Romanian, but I kept saying in English, I, what I mean by it is keeping children safe. 
So even finding the explanation, I found it hard to translate it because it's one of those uh, one of those very complex terms which is very difficult to actually translate. But this module what's called, is very very helpful to us because it gives you the information that you need about child safeguarding. It gives you the facilitation techniques, and also you can choose you can select from it what you feel it's useful and what is more home to you, the ones that you truly resonate with. Now, I remember when we did the TOT in Bucharest, I remember when we did an activity, and probably some of us that have been in that TOT now will be smiling. We did an activity when one of the groups did a very, very interesting and shocking role play activity. They faked an injury, they faked a football match in the training room, and they faked an injury. Now, when that happened, you should have seen all of us that didn't know about what they were going to do, going to do and the shock on our faces. All of us, we felt it was real. It was a real clash between two people there, but it wasn't. But they did it so well that straight away we were thinking, whoa, hold on a second, what's happening here? But we've learned a lot from that. We've learned about the impact, and if that was a training environment, now what is the real impact when that, let's say somebody, a coach might say to their team, you go on you go on that on that field and you play to intimidate your opponent sometimes it does happen but what's the impact on the other children is not good isn't it it's not good to feel intimidated i want to play the game to feel good about it not to actually feel intimidated but that was a wonderful wonderful exercise so thank you for, to those involved in that activity i will carry with me forever because i've learned a lot from from us and how we responded to that now the last one is about the youth and parents' engagements. Now, we know, we talked about the voice of the child. We talked about the voice of the young people. Let's also think about the voice of the parents, but also let's see how we can guide, how we can coach the parents to make sure that their input in the sports life, in the summer camp, it's, it, it leads towards the best outcomes for the children and the best outcomes for those involved in the game. So that's why in this one, we talked about motivation. We talked about how we can motivate children, how we can motivate parents as well. Also, we talked about the relationships. I know, for example, I perform better if I have positive and safe relationships. Exactly the same for the children. And here to just mention one of our, uh, and I know I could mention everyone from the TOT, that, uh, all the people that were in the TOT, but I just want to mention here Jessie. Jessie is one of our great gymnasts coaches, and Jessie, she's very good at knowing how to talk to the children, and she's very good at creating the activity in such a way so the children don't even realize that they are working towards higher performance. They are feeling like it's a, it's a fun activity, but also through that dance, through those moves, they actually become better and better into actually performing the moves from the gymnastics activity. So let's think about that. How do I do that? How do I actually motivate the child? How do I move the child from external motivation towards inner motivation? Yeah, and some of us have it. Some of us have to learn how to do that. Now, in terms of some practical exercises for mental training, how do we do that? How do I make sure that I'm not stressed? I know, for example, this, this world crisis with COVID, it puts so much pressure on all of us. Probably some of us had COVID. We know it's not easy. Some of us had very, very easy. Some others had it harder. And we know it's not easy to go through those. But what we know the impact was on all of us is that all of us, we couldn't do the things that we liked doing the most. Us as coaches, we could not go to the gyms to do the activities there with the children. We moved it online. In the summer camps, the activities were pretty much reduced because of all of this threat with spreading the COVID. So that impact was there on us. I know most of us managed to move online, which is great. But again, we are crying out for those moments when we can be back together to have the physical contact with the children, to work with one another so we can achieve, we can make them feel more more motivated. So I know I can talk a lot. I know I've been talking a lot over the last 50 minutes now about, uh, about this curricula. So I'm just going to pause here for a few seconds. I will be looking at the questions soon. And I just please write your comments there in the box in the chat. Tell us, how does it feel to you? Just hearing about this at this moment in time. Soon enough, this would be available publicly as well. So Christina and Maria, they are working hard to get them in the, in the, in the best format to actually uh, make them public um, on, the, on the Child Hub. So you'll be having that. And I'm sure we can send you an alert message as well to say that it's available now. So you'll be having it there. But write, us, uh, write a few messages, please, in the chat box just to see how does it feel? Is it okay? Is it not? Do I feel now that it's more relevant to me? Or do I feel that through this presentation, actually, I'm, I'm estranging from it. I'm moving further away from me as a safeguarding parent, yeah, a, a person. 
Either way, it's okay. For us, we learn from your experiences. We learn from what you say to us. And your views are very, very important. That's why towards this, uh, the end of this presentation or this webinar, we will be inviting you to actually answer three questions. And please take the time to do that one as well. Take the time to tell us how useful this has been to you. Now, for the next uh, 10 minutes, I would like us to look at the policy. Why? It's, it's very good that we've done the curricula. It's very good that we've done the capacity development, but also we need to see how can we, all of us, be accountable? How can we all play that role uh, in terms of keeping children safe? How can I be responsible for safeguarding children? And we all have that responsibility. We know sometimes, as we say in, in education, for example, we are saying this, our role as teachers is to educate children, but also to keep children safe. And I think that applies to us as well. In the summer camps, our role is to make sure that the children have the best extracurricular activities, but also to keep them safe. At the sports clubs of federation, our role is to, to, uh, to train children, to help some of them to reach the higher levels of performance, but also to keep them safe. So it works hand in hand where safety and well-being and the sports activities or recreational activities, they do work hand in hand there. Now, in order for us to do that, I would like to show you just briefly, what do we mean by that child safeguarding policy? Now, if the curricula is a longer document and it's okay to be longer, why? Because you'll see in there, it's a lot of good training materials that you can use. I know after we've done the TLT in Bucharest and also in Greece, what did we do? After that, we, we, we guided the participants in the TLT how they can actually uh, do sessions of training based on those materials. And we can say successfully that it's working very, very well. More and more people come to these training sessions. And as Maria said, if initially we started with resistance or they were resistant, after that they embrace it and they could embrace this opportunity. Why? Because they understand and we understand our part in keeping children safe. Now, how, what, what are the first, what is the first thing that we could do, for example? The first thing would be to have a look at this policy. It's not a lengthy document, yeah? It just, you'll see that it's far shorter. It's about 20, 20, 20 something pages. Have a look into it and read it and just see how much sense does it make to you. Just look at those, um, look at, for example, when it explains how it applies to all of us. Have a look into that and see, does it really apply to me? And if you feel that it doesn't apply to you, Get in touch with Christina, get in touch with Maria, have a discussion with them to see, probably we need a follow-up discussion there. That's always very much welcomed. And as I said, we learn from your views, we learn from your experiences. Now, after we think that we might implement that, let's also learn a little bit about the, the key areas from this child safeguarding policy. First of all, it is preventative measures. What do we mean by that? We are being prevented, preventive by actually adopting the safeguarding policy, by looking, reviewing, and understanding the roles and responsibilities, by having code of conduct, by looking at that disciplinary process for non-compliance. Uh, earlier, I mentioned about this when I said about allegations, by doing safe recruitment, by doing awareness and training, by doing risk assessments in all, all sorts of possible questions. A risk assessment when a child is asked to go back and continue playing whilst being injured, but also a risk assessment when we do the overnight stays. How many adults are going with a group of 10 children, for example? There are some standards there that it would be very informative to us and we can use those. Now, supervision of children, online social media, use pictures and videos. More and more, we are concerned about this virtual environment for the children. And we are seeing many, many children who actually suffer because of what is called cyber, cyber bullying, or in England, we refer to it sometimes as sexting. Yeah. So it's a lot of good information there. And also what's good about these measures is that you also have next to it templates, templates that we worked hard to put together. So you don't have to create these things. You just have to take them, look at them and then adapt them to make sure that it makes sense to you. Now, also we need to do responsive measures. And what do we, what do we mean by that? When there is an incident, when there is a safeguarding incident, and safeguarding incident, what is it? It could be that one of us does something that indicates that the child is going to be at risk, or we do something to actually put the child in a risk situation. So in that situation, we need to follow these incidents uh, forms, we need to complete them, and we need to look at the journey of actually reporting this to the local authorities. Now, in the past, there were situations when, let's say, as a coach, probably I worked with somebody who kept making all sorts of um, sexualized comments about girls and boys yeah, whilst they were in training. Now, that is an incident that I should be aware of because why would I make those comments? I shouldn't. I shouldn't make comments to make the children feel um, less valued, to make the children feel vulnerable. Children are there to learn from me how they can perform 
better, how they can excel at that sport and to enjoy the sport, not to hear both sorts of comments. But in one of those situations, what happened when somebody starts talking and we identify that it was a risk situation, the person that made those comments, they said, look, this is my resignation. I'm going to leave the club effective immediately. And in both cases, we allow that person to actually leave, to go away, rather than alerting the local authorities about their behaviors and what they did uh, to, to, to hurt the children, to harm the children, for example. Now, because we let that person go, that person, a few weeks later, they were knocking on somebody else's door, another club or another summer camp, and they offered their services. Now, because probably they didn't disclose what happened in the previous uh, uh, setting, because they did not put that setting as a reference, the new agency or the new organization didn't know about the previous concerns. So by default, we allowed this person to be back in a situation of working directly with children when we knew very, very well that he or she actually posed risk to children. And that's why it's important to always complete these incidents, always discuss with one another to see what is it? Am I right in being worried? And if I'm right in being worried, what will I do about it now? Yeah, after that, after we have the discussion internally, and hopefully, probably in 10 years from now, all of us, all of us, uh, the summer camps, the sports clubs, sports federations, we will be able, we will be having the child safeguarding champion. Now, if we have that person, of course, he or she, or they are the first point of contact, we'll be discussing the incident, and then we'll be de deciding together, that, do we have enough information to report this, or don't we? The model as it is applied in England, if this incident was to happen, when that person says, Paul, could you please sign my resignation? I'll say, yes, I will sign it because you want me to sign it. But also I will be informing, which is called the DBS, Disclosure and Barring Service. Now that service in Romania is the police department, the police department that deals with, um, with the certificates for integrity. So we have, these bodies are also there. I'm sure we have it in Greece as well. So my duty is to inform the DBS, Disclosure and Barring Service, and that goes on this person's record. So when this person wants to work with children again, it will come to light that actually this person made those sexualized comments. Do I want him or her there? Probably not, because I don't want my children to be exposed to any forms of abuse. And the last thing that we have there is the whistleblower um, protection clause. Now, I mentioned earlier about the whistleblower. What is whistleblower? It's not that, it's not some, and usually we've seen in the past cases when somebody did the whistleblower role and then they were punished. They lost their job when they did that. That is not supposed to happen, is not meant to happen. If I'm a whistleblower, it means that I raise concerns within my organization about poor practice. So when that happens, my organization has to look at their safeguarding policy and try and think, what can I do? What can we do to make sure that that situation doesn't happen again? So it might be, let's say we talk about um, sexting. We talked about sexting. And if I don't have a, a specific section in my policy about sex about sexting, probably we should put that together. Probably we should do that. I remember an incident here, it happened in Romania some good months ago, when a netball coach, actually he managed to get pictures with, uh, with the girls that were in, in his team, and he was actually blackmailing with the girls to send him more pictures, but now he was going from comments such as, oh, look how sport help you, develop a very beautiful body, he was saying, send me a picture in which I can see your breasts, send me a picture and you can see your bottom, for example. Straight away, we could see that that coach, he was definitely, he was moving towards, he was abusing children, and he was doing more and more um, uh, things that could hurt and harm the children. And, and, uh, and it's good that we caught that. It's good that the girls spoke about it, and then we did the right thing to actually stop that abuse from happening. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm not going to say thank you as well. I'm just going to pause there. I will, um, I will uh, uh, minimize my screen just to uh, have a quick look in the, in the sentences. Now, whilst I look at the sentences, Maria and Christina, would you like to add anything to what I've just said regarding the curricula and regarding the child safeguarding policy? So please step in here. I'm just going to stop share and have a look at the chat box, OK? Thank you very, very much, Paul. You did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of information, Edith, a lot of information to take in. But as I said, for everyone, we do have their, we do have their more, um, we do have their, the, the, the content, the curricula, you do have their, the policy. And uh, let's, if you don't have questions, let's put it this way. If you don't have questions in the chat box, then I'm going to ask you questions. Shall we do this game together? Yeah, let's ask questions. Let's yeah. have a dialogue. Now, what I would like to ask, based on what I said so far, I would like all of us to open the chat and just to write in the chat, 
to answer this question with yes or no. Are you interested to find out more about the curricula and the policy? I'm keeping my eyes on the chat now. And I would like to see some people typing that. Okay, I can see the yes and yes coming. Okay. Okay, so that's good. So we stirred your interest and it is there. Now, if you don't know how to get it, of course, Christina and Maria can do that. Also, it's very good that we are also translating this in different languages. I know Greek and Romanian is a priority. The other languages, we still have it available in, uh, in, in English. So, so if, you, if you want to, to have it in English, we can send it to you there. Now, the other question that I would like to ask, based on the discussion, based on my long, long monologue there, does this child safeguarding apply to you? Please write in the chat, okay? Okay, so we have, please say no as well. If it doesn't apply to you, just say no. It's absolutely fine. Okay, we can see yes, we can see it does apply. Okay. Can I add a comment here, Paul, please? Absolutely, Maria, please step in. So uh, during the last weeks, we have been working a lot on whether child safeguarding policies apply to all contexts because every partner, every agency have also their own things established through many years ago and also their own rules. For instance, in the summer camps in Greece, an adult has to stay with the children in the same room, even this is against the best practice um, internationally. So it is okay if uh, some policies do not apply to some context and we can contextualize them. But the, the way we do it in Greece is that we set a precondition that the minimum international standards are kept, like the policy procedures, people and accountability. So yes, the policies can be adjusted to apply more some context or meet the, the specificities there. Um, and what it, uh, it is enough, it's sufficient, at least for now, is that we have the minimum standards being in place. We have struggled a lot ourselves in Greece to make this apply to every um, summer camp and also other contexts. But we think that this is like uh, a minimum thing we can keep and then make it applicable to all contexts. I, I'm so happy that you mentioned that, Maria, why? Because those minimum standards are the core thing for us. And that's what we use to actually build all the curricula to build the policy. Now, just to give us an example there, in case, in case we need more evidence, why do we need to do that? Yeah, so we put together this uh, standard minimum standard, min, standard based on the minimum standards of safety. We put these policies together and it might be that we might find it absolutely useful. But what if, let's think about gymnastics and let's also think about the summer camps in Greece. Yep. And if, if you are from another country, choose any sport that you can think of. So let's imagine that I'm that person working directly with girls. I have a, a team of girls and I have girls that come from different parts of the world. We know in Greece, we know that we work with, uh, with the migrant camps as well. Yeah. So it might be that we have a child from a different culture and we might actually identify very, very quickly that that child has consistent time aches. So we send the child to the doctor, the, the doctor prescribes the medicine, and the child comes back with again, it comes with, with, with tummy aches. Now we know through the discussion, what if we find out that that child actually experienced FGM, female genital mutilation. So we know in some African countries, it's still happening as a cultural practice, but in the Western world, in Europe, we are saying clearly, that is one of the most severe forms of abuse. Now you might want, if you're in that situation at the club, after you've implemented the policy, after that, if you have one of those cases, usually the good practice tells this, let's add the part about FGM to my policy to see how do I respond to those concerns. And this is how, based on the new knowledge, this is how we can add more things there. Another example could be, more and more we heard about this uh, long after terrorist attacks. Now in the UK, we are very hard on this and we are saying if a child or if an adult makes a comment like, I hate all whites, I hate all blacks, I hate Muslims, I hate whoever, that's the first thing when the alarm bells goes on and we need to actually think, do I need to put something in place? If any of you comes across this situation, probably you will find that it would be useful to add another part to your policy in which you're saying, if somebody does make this comment, how do we respond to it? And this is our policy can become broader and broader, but also more specific for those types of abuse or those things that could lead to type of abuse. Does it make sense? Yeah, so that, that's the way we can see. I know we might say, but Paul, this means that we're not gonna do sport and, uh, 
uh, activities anymore. We'll be doing just policies, policies, policies. It might seem like that, but it doesn't have to be a long exercise. For example, radicalization, you just need to do it in a few lines just to say, what do we mean by that? And what do I do? I call the local police department straight away because I'm concerned that that child or that person might do something like they did in Manchester at Aniara Grande's uh, concert when that guy just blew himself up. Yeah. So that's what we need to do it very briefly so we are aware of it. For me, I would be very, very curious to have this the same discussion probably in five years from now and just to see how many items have we actually identified there. Yeah? Because we will identify them, we will see them. And again, it could be different from one sport to another. But also I'll be curious to find out from you. And we know the main sports are here, football and gymnastics, but also the summer camp with a lot of recreational activities. It would be good in probably next year when we'll do a review or at the end of this project, just to try and see how much all of us contributed to expand that list. So to make that list more, more comprehensive based on our experiences of being there with the children and delivering those activities. So that's gonna be, I would like to put this challenge to all of us because all of us, we can contribute, okay? So please think about it and give us the feedback. Tell us how we can make it better, okay? Paul, uh, one more thing from my side, please. Absolutely. How much time do we have? Uh, I think we'll finish uh, in about 19 minutes, something like that. I think we said two hours. Okay, just one more minute. So challenge accepted, said someone. Okay, perfect. Sorry, Maria. Yeah, <laughs> Somebody said challenge accepted. More, okay. <laughs> some more experience from Greece, because actually, what comes to my mind a lot, and it's really indicative to the context, is what the Kennedy said, the Canadian athletes. Uh -huh. I mean, not Kennedy. He was an athlete that was really many times abused, sexually abused by his uh, coach. Uh -huh. So his co-athlete said that if you don't want to believe it, you won't see it. So, and this is something we also talked about um, many times in Greece. So what we um, actually experienced during the last months is that, is that people when they started hearing about our efforts, we're really resistant and we're saying like, this is not here. There is no child abuse in, in um, you know, in sports. There is no such a case. We are all professionals. And it was like a couple of weeks ago that the, um, a Greek champion, uh, Miss Sofia Bekatoru, uh, disclosed that she was sexually abused when she was like 20 something, a little before she got the golden uh, medal in Olympic games. She was sexually abused by a person that is right now the vice president of the federation. So that was actually the starting point for a wave of disclosures the past weeks from Greek, in the Greek settings, both in sports and also in arts, mm -hmm. um, that for, for us, for the project, it, it actually acted as a motivation. So right now we have actors calling us and saying, sorry, I didn't read your emails or I didn't understand that we are doing, uh, and they're trying to have a policy in place right now because they, they now believe it, so they see it. So this is just what I wanted to, to add here. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you to I share that. Thank you to share that, Maria. And I think it's wonderful to hear. It's not wonderful to hear. It's wonderful that we are discussing about these things, but it's tragic that it has happened, isn't it? For me, what, what I've learned over the past 20 years that I've been involved in this field, in the child safeguarding and child protection arena, what I've learned is that when we put the right things in place, we will see that children will come and talk to us. Adults will come and talk to us. And what we'll need to do is we need to be prepared to respond to those sorts of situations. But it's not easy. It's very, very complex. What we have seen, for example, when there is historical abuse, like the one that you've just mentioned, Maria, what's happening there? There is a lot of resistance. How could you say that about he or she or whatever? How could you do that? We can say it and we are advised to say it. Why? because we know that children suffer unless I speak up about this. So that's why it's good to hear about this thing. That's why as another challenge to all of us in here is if you feel that when you start sharing information about what we've heard today, when you feel that somebody might actually disclose something to you, try and link also with the local authority or with the child protection teams within your area and try and see how you can link it with them because we know we have to do something. To link this a little bit further with... Um, and I don't know whether I said this, if I said this, I apologize if I said it earlier today, uh, about after Andy Woodward, he came to the press and he talked about the abuse that he experienced. So that happened in November, 2016. 
in, uh, in January 2017, so a few months later, the main football clubs in London, they said that they were aware of uh, about such allegations, about such disclosures, but guess what? They did nothing because nobody from the child protection agencies asked them questions. Now, this is very, very sad because for me as a human being, for example, if I know that somebody, su somebody suffers, Will I just turn the blind eye? I hope I don't, because we need to do something about it. But even in England, when we are saying that the systems are so well developed, even here we can see that we have failed. We have failed to actually hear to what a young person like Andrew told us, and we failed to actually do something about it. So sometimes indeed it does happen. What I'm inviting all of us to do is not to turn the blind eye, but to be curious. Yeah? So it's always, let's be curious. I wonder how it feels to be the child. That I wonder, in my view, it's one of the most wonderful verbs. When I start, I wonder, what do I do? I want to empathize with the child. I want to understand the child. I want to hear what the child has to me. And also, I want to involve the child in the decision-making process. I want them to know that they were right to tell me about the abuse. And also, I'll be explaining to them how actually I can support them now to make sure that the abuse stops there and there. Now, I am mindful that whilst I talked about curricula and about policy, and also from Maria's uh, uh, experience, we talked more about sexual abuse. Yes, it is. Sexual abuse is pretty much in the media these days. It's been in the media for the past at least seven or eight years now. From the US, we heard about Dr. Larry Nassar, yeah, Nassar the one that sexually abused a number of gymnasts from the, from the uh, Olympic team in, in, in the US. The, but also, it's not just about sexual abuse. It could be physical abuse, about those accidental or accidental marks. It could be also neglect. When, for example, children do sport, in, in uh, inappropriate conditions, when the children don't have enough water on a very, very hot day, for example. That can happen in the sports clubs, that can happen also in the, in the summer camps. It could be emotional abuse, all of those abuse, all of those shouting, swearing. When you will watch that video, it will be very, very interesting. And probably, unless there are questions, what we can do, I can share the video now so we can watch it together and just to see what the children tell us about that emotional abuse. So probably I'll be continue talking for the next two minutes and then I can show I can show that video and we'll see what we feel about it. But I'm just going to pause there. And I just want to see, I'm not seeing any questions there. I just, I'm just giving a quick look to see, are there any questions that I've missed? Okay. Okay. I'm not seeing the questions. I'm just going to play the video now. And I would say, when we look at this video, please have your head roll on right now. So if you're a practitioner working in the social care or child protection, be that. If you're a coach, be that. If you are uh, working for a summer camp, be that. So you need to, to use that head roll on now. And also, when you look at the video, try and think, try and think, what is the impact? What do I hear from this child when they tell me about what has happened to them? And when they tell me, what do they expect from us in case, in case there is anything wrong with that sports magic kit? And let's see what they mean by that sport magic kit. So I'm just going to share my screen now and we'll watch this for the next three minutes and then we'll come back. And please, when you watch this, please think about how do I feel when I watch a child telling me about their magic sports kit? My sports kit is magical. And mine is too. In fact, we all have magic sports kits. You might think they're ordinary, but when we wear them to compete, the magic takes over. But you can't tell why they're special. They don't make us run faster, swim better, or score more runs. In fact, these kits don't help us at all. So why are they magical? Well, when we're not wearing our magic kits, the adults that we meet are kind to us. They treat us with respect. Or before the competition starts. They don't expect too much. And if we make a mistake, they're OK about it. But when we're wearing these magic sports kits and start to compete, something very different happens. We seem to become older. The grown-ups watching shout at us. They swear at us. They call us names. They treat us like we've been playing for years and get really mad when we make a mistake. Often, they get so angry that they shout at the referee and each other. And sometimes things get so bad, they end up fighting. Fights between parents, coaches, referees, and even young players like us. At some matches, things get so bad, 
that the police get involved. It's embarrassing. It puts me off my game. It sets a bad example. And worst of all, most of these grown-ups are parents of the kids playing. Some young people have given up their sport because of the power of the magic sports kit. Sometimes the magic kit makes parents push us too hard. They expect us to play like sports stars. All they're bothered about is us winning. Help us get rid of this bad magic. Remember, it's our game, not yours. Treat us all with respect. Encourage everyone, not just your own kids. Support the coaches and the referees. Have fun when you're watching us, and help us to have fun too. Let's bring out the real magic of sport. Okay, I'm just going to pause the video there. And now I would like us to do exactly the same. So please, in the chat box, please write there, how did you feel? How did you feel watching this? And how did we feel actually hearing teacher, hearing children telling us exactly how that sports kit apparently is not a good thing. For me personally, when I watched this video for the first time, I was thinking, well, the magic sports kit, that must be a positive experience for the child. But what did they tell us? Actually, it is not that positive. When we as adults, when we as grown-ups, what do we do? Actually, we start shouting. We are sometimes we're saying, I'm because I'm passionate. I could be passionate, but I don't have to swear to the child. I don't have to shout to the child. I don't have to do all of those things that have a, an adverse or a negative emotional impact on the child. Yeah? So please take a minute to reflect about that. And if you found this video useful, please use it. Yeah? Use it there, spread the word about it. I'm not aware whether you can find it with subtitles in your own language, but I'm sure you'll be able to, to relate it. You'll be able to describe it to the others. And with that, I'm just gonna end my speech there. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you again for uh, obviously for uh, listening into um, all this monologue about child safeguarding and child uh, child protection of children in sport and in the summer camps. You will get the presentation as well. We have it in PDF format, and I'm sure Christina will make this available as well, so you can have it, uh, and you can also come back to us with any more questions. We are always open to answer those. Now, I'm going to ask uh, Marius here. Marius, can you help me, please, to put those three questions in the chat box? And I would like us to take a few yes. minutes, please. In a few minutes, you'll see three questions there in the, in the chat box. And when you look at those, those questions are about... Um, are about learning points. So what do you think? What caused you to reflect during the last two hours that we've been together? Just write in a few words. I like that or I didn't like that. Write us good and bad so we can get an idea how, how helpful this has been to all of us. Now, the second question is about any needs identified. Now, was there anything? Was there any anything that you've identified to yourself as a need? What, what we can do to help you or what you can do yourself to actually achieve better in terms of keeping children safe in sport and also in the summer camps. And also the third question, it invites you to think about what could be or what are your other learning needs there? It might be based on what you're saying to us, we might actually organize other webinars on that specific topic. So please tell us what could be of high interest to you so we can actually, we can actually answer that. I'm just having a quick, quick look at what Maria said. It's, this means that children sometimes need help but submit to power and uh, take too long to ask uh, to ask for help. We ought to prevent this by raising awareness with coaches, with professionals, with all those things that work in the, in the summer camps. Absolutely right. I'm particularly interested in Zoom. Uh, harassment and training uh, when, when, when training coaches. That's why we will quantify all of this feedback. So please write it there. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you very much for listening again. Thank you for the patience. And, and also, also, I'll be looking forward to meet you again in webinars or why not sometimes in the face-to-face -face training rooms when that's going to be available. Now, I'll be quiet now, Christina. If you want to take over the lead and uh, end this session, please feel free to do so, uh, Christina or Maria. Yes. Thank you very, very much, Paul. And thank you, everybody, for your patience and for uh, your interest in this important topic. So... Um, we are eager to hear you if you have any other questions and please complete the, the answers. And the Feshti, I, I saw in the chat Feshti Edlira uh, ask us if schools are involved in this project. 
So we would like in the future to involve as well schools. Many school, uh, scholar clubs, for instance, in Romania belong to schools or to the educational minister, but now uh, we don't have yet. But it's true, safeguarding policies should be part of uh, the school uh, setting as well. To answer, because I saw it was not the answer. Thank you very much. And please. Uh, Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Bye. I, I, I've also mentioned Nine my email people. in the chat box, uh, Christina. If anyone wants to make contact with me, I've put my email there. So please feel free. I'm always interested in having more discussions on these themes. And then hopefully, as I said, hopefully we'll meet together. So thank you again. And there will be international webinars as well in the project up to August. So we will invite you next time as well. Numim, vii și noi prezenți. The questions, right? In the chat I will already put the Because it, they the will help us in our evaluation. Yes. I'm trying to see the question, but if somebody can just guide me how to, uh, how to, uh, or where to find Maybe we it. can put them on the screen, just for everybody to I see. I put the question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. But, uh, Maybe we can put them. We at, can put on the screen. Marius on the screen. I will. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so please, if you do that, Marius, that's going to be very, very helpful. Just or whilst we do this technical thing, if anybody else wasn't has any questions, please just unmute and ask the question. Let's let's have a dialogue for the next few minutes. I'm just curious, how do we cope with silence? We know children sometimes are silent when we talk about uh, child safety and child safeguarding. Okay, so let's see. Uh, can you make it bigger, uh, Marius? Just to... Or is it just me? My screen is probably smaller. Okay, so what's are the free questions? No. Now, I'm just going to stop uh, there for a few moments at the question from um, Afed Dita. It's a very good question. Thank you for raising it. So these are children with health problems who are forced to exercise compulsory activity in pre-university education. Now, I remember a study, I think it was in Germany, and it was a study which spoke about this issue, and they spoke about how we force and how we, uh, we fail to acknowledge the impact on the mental health of these young people. It was, I think it was young females athletes and we fail to acknowledge the, the impacts. And so we've seen that there is a high rate of quitting sport. We've also seen that it was um, a high rate of uh, suicide and also a lot of other mental health difficulties. Now we can look at these issues at, at, at all ages. Let's also think about, let's think about girls when they start, when they enter puberty. Yeah, so that could be 10, 11, 12 years old. So when we think about those times, even in those cases, how do our PE teachers, our physical, physical education teachers, how much are they aware that in those days, probably girls are less comfortable. They are less able to do the physical activity compared to the days when they don't have their periods. So even that, but this is a lot of education that's needed there. This is where we need to raise awareness. This is when we need to actually say, look, it's not okay. It's not okay to actually do that. So that's why, that's why uh, looking at um, Afedita's question, can all children perform the same? 
No, they cannot, and no, they should not. Even, even pre-university education, we should not actually do that. Let's think more and more about vocation, vocational. Let's think more about what I'm interested in, because the child might be very interested to do a, a kind of more, um, let's say, a slower sport, like, I don't know, uh, trying to think here. It could be yes, just to do a kind of... Um, table tennis, if they don't like running that much, when somebody else might want to do the, the, the big courtyard tennis. Yeah. So all of this, all of this, we need to look into that. Now, are we thinking about these aspects? In England, we do think about these practices more and more often. In other countries, it's just the start of the journey when we are looking at this, the impact, when we try to ascertain the impact. And again, I'll go back to what I said several times today. Let's think about the voice of, all, of those people. Do we give them a voice for them to tell us what's happening there? Just forcing a child or young person to do this, what's going to be the impact? We're just going to create another barrier. And when the child, just like one of the children says in the, said in the video, it will, some of us will quit. If that's the activity that I've been forced into, I'll quit doing the sport at the earliest opportunity. Do we want that? No, we want children, we are young people, young adults to do more sport, to be healthier, not to run away from sport. Yeah. So I hope I also just briefly there on this, on this topic, I've that we can do the whole day webinar on this to share examples as well. It's very, very complex, very complicated. And we need all to see how we can do things where, where we are. And slowly we, we can address that. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Also the message from, uh, from Luz Mertz, uh, okay, in Belgium, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, child protection policies and developing them. It's very interesting, it's very good to hear all of this. The one thing that I would like to highlight is, is let's also think about the common, common parts in all of this. All of these policies, they have the same thing in common. It's about the safety, it's about those international standards. So they are all of them there. But also, as I said, pay attention to those aspects which are specific, for example, to Belgium, specific to your area of work. It could be summer camps, it could be sports clubs. It's very important to include those aspects as well there. And also you don't have to recreate, we don't have to reinvent the wall, the, 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 the wheel there. Terdezom has a very good one. Also, you can find others on, online. Just find the ones that you find useful and use it to the best of your capacity to fit it, make it fit for purpose for your organization. Okay, once again, thank you all and hope to see you soon. And please, if you can, just share your feedback in the chat box before you, you close the meeting. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.
Bye. Goodbye. Now I, I close it. So see you soon. Thank you very much.